Welcome to The Donut Show. I'm your host, Paisal Flatt, and today's episode features a truly inspiring conversation with Jerome Wesley, the Chief Commercial Officer at Funtico. This interview holds a special place in our hearts as it was conducted under extraordinary challenging circumstances. Doron generously shared his time and insights with us while at the hospital supporting his wife Amy during her cancer treatments. Sadly, Amy Wesley passed away shortly after this was recorded. At Doron's request and with deep respect for his and Amy's courage, we are honored to share this dialogue with you. Today we delve into the insights of a seasoned leader in advertising, exploring the resilience it takes to lead in times of personal adversity. Join us as we gain perspective from Doron Wesley, a figure of professional strength and personal fortitude. Deserve to win when it matters most. Facing multi-billion dollar bet the company litigation? No problem, that's why we're here. Troutman Amin. LLP is a true legal powerhouse. All right, buckle up, folks. Today on the Adonis Show, I pay Slack Latin have snagged none other than Dorn Wesley, the former CEO of Perksy. This guy's brain's a treasure trove of insight that'll make you rethink everything you thought you knew about advertising. So get ready for a ride that's bound to be more exhilarating than your first caffeine kick of a day. Let's dive in. So, Doron. It's so nice to see you. <laughs> How are you doing? I think that's my phone. Oh. <laughs> I'm doing great. Oh, on my computer. I'm doing fantastic. So you've Thank turned you very much. the digital dust of ad tech into solid gold with more finesse than a magician. What's your secret potion for mixing technology with creativity? And can more mere mortals replicate it? Replicate it, or do you need a sprinkle of Dutch Israeli wizardry? I mean, the Dutch Israeli wizardry certainly helps because we tend to be aggressive and we tend to be pragmatic. But I think that many people have the sense of sensibility in them, meaning that if you can crystallize a message that speaks to people and tells them exactly what you're trying to do, then you can very much replicate the success. So reflecting on your roller coaster career, what was the wildest ride from heart, Hot Bar to Perksy? I mean, it's crazy, you know, starting at the brand side and then coming to Israel, meeting the founders of Hot Bar. Israel was at that time going through a renaissance, you know, uplifting of of technology companies, startups, and all you needed was just experience with the internet, really. In Ben Yehuda Street in Tel Aviv, there were startups after startups after startups, and all you could see was trucks coming in with like big monitors. At that time, we had monitors, and you knew that something was happening in that building. And so, you know, the journey was really a natural progression. We went to New York, we opened up the office, and we started to grit. You know, I started to get a bigger network of people. New York, obviously, at that time was a hub of advertising, advertising technology. And it really enabled me to connect with people face to face, something that I think is very much missing today, which I feel very badly for the new generation that's in our technology sector, relationships that enabled me to continue and see opportunities along the way. So from Hot Bar, it became Lycos. From Lycos, it became the IAB. And what people often don't realize in our industry is that it it is those serendipity, moments of serendipity that really create magic in our industry. So in my case, right, when I was at Lycos, every Friday night to kind of exchange traffic between each other because traffic was often misrepresented by the, by the rating companies. This was right. before the MRC accreditation. And that established a relationship. And then we went on together to embark on cross media studies to help people understand on an industry level, you know, what digital meant for the marketing. And so as that progressed, it kind of enabled me to see an opportunity within the IAB to kind of take on the role of leading that together with Greg Stewart and Rex Briggs, who you interviewed in the past. And then from that point on, you know, once we did it on an industry level, you know, there were companies out there that wanted to productize it. So Milwaukee Brown came along and said, hey, Duran, you talk a good talk. Can you actually productize it? So I said, sure, let's productize it. And I went there and we did what we did for the industry, but then on an on a enterprise level. And once we did that, some clients said to me, you know what, it's nice that you're advising us about helping us, you know, do cross media measurement. What about if you just take on ownership of media investment and actually do it yourself together with the team? So that's when I joined Samsung and Chill in Korea. Thankfully, I didn't have at that point a family, so it was easy to just hop over and do it. And it was a really great learning experience. And after about two years of being an expat, I came back to New York and came back to WPP to help lead business science and planning for Mindshare, which is exactly the same thing that I was doing at Samsung, but then advising our 
agency clients. I was feeling uh, a little bit lost in the large companies. I missed the excitement of startups. There are many challenges when you go into a small environment, but the exhilarating aspect of being able to actually build something with your hands, roll up your sleeve, not having a tie, and actually creating something out of nothing was too enticing. And I was lucky enough to go with Randy Kilgore and Bill Day into Tremor Video and help them prepare to go public. So I went to a video platform, worked on a DSP and SSP side of it. At that time, programmatic was still very much in its infancy, right? People were talking about it, people were doing it, we were building it. So it just, it was a natural progression for me, going from brand to ad research to research and then into the video world, specifically because CTV was up and coming at that time. And that led me eventually to other startups where people said, oh, you have an interesting brain that thinks differently. Can you help us grow the business? So I helped with Lodomy, which is a DMP, still around, obviously Andy Monfried, a great person. And then I said, you know what, let me go a little bit into the crypto world. Crypto was at that time becoming hot and I knew very little bit of it. And I like to try things that I don't know. I would highly recommend it to anybody, by the way. That's a very Dutch-Israeli trade. Go into something you don't know and own it. And right. I went in it and I burned myself really badly. And I believe very much that you should burn yourself a couple of times in life in order to understand what works and what doesn't work. Helped create a self-sovereign identity, set it up in New York and Brooklyn and raised funds for it. Then I had a problem with my partner who felt the need to spend the money on other things. That's beside the point. And, and then went on to another crypto project, which was in the NFT marketplace. It was a very right. first fully client marketplace and then ultimately helping Perk see with the reorganization that the company needed. That's kind of the hey, journey. So how do you keep like how do you keep creativity sparkling in an industry that's predictable as a plot twist in a soap opera? Do you have a muse on on speed dial, or is it all in the hummus? It's Bob Ganoush for me, not hummus. But I would say, I would say, wow, that's a very good question, Pesach. You know, yes, it is. At the end of the day, we're still doing the same thing, right? We're selling eyeballs to people, and there's a whole bunch of people right. that we put in between to try and get there. I do believe that each time that we learn what doesn't work, each time when we learn that we went too far, we readjust. Each time that we fear that there's regulation coming to nail us down as an industry, we finally man up or woman up, whatever you want to call it, and we clean up right. our act. So I think that, you know, it's the same thing. What you and I were doing 20 years ago is still the same thing today. I think that we're learning from mistakes. I think that we're learning from our mistakes. I'm hoping that we're learning from our mistakes. And I'm hoping that we're applying some of those things to make it more better for people. I think that what we sometimes forget is that, A, when you do B2B marketing, right, specifically, we tend to forget that we're speaking to a person who has their own needs in place. And we don't often take that into consideration. Second, when we talk to consumers, I think that we often speak like they're stupid and they're not stupid. Right. We just make it overcomplicated. And so I think that that's where we're constantly trying to improve ourselves and become better in the way we talk to people. Again, we have a long road to go and our industry still has a lot of dark spots. Um, but I do believe that ultimately, ultimately, forget about all of the, the buzzwords, programmatic, RTB, SPO, SS, you know, whatever you're trying to do, it's all valid. At the end of the day, we're trying to get information to another person and we try to monetize it and we're trying to make it commercially viable for other people to live off. Right. And as long as you keep that in mind, everything else can fall in line. So what do you think the biggest facepalm moment you've had while navigating the high sea of ab tech is? Is a moment so outrageous that even Howard Stern would blush? I don't think anything would make him blush because it starts and ends with sex with him, which is awesome. And I wish my job would start and end with sex. It doesn't. It's not that glamorous. Even at Hot Bar? <laughs> Hot Bar was pretty crazy. I mean, we used, I have to admit. You, we you used guys a had a lot of money rolling. You worked with, uh, we, what was her name? Erin Midorsky? What was her name? Erin. Erin Midorsky. Yeah, she was actually a creative person on the team which was amazing yeah i remember we actually Aaron and i actually went on a date which ended up terribly by the way but we still <laughs> love each other i think that we use skin listen skin cells and it doesn't scale with hot bar it's it's sold with samsung if you look at the ads that right. we use in samsung we use k-pop and k-pop sells it's sex um, right. wow what would make him blush i think what would make him blush is how inconsiderate we are when it comes to privacy i think that's what would make our oh, yeah. stern blush we have trampled yeah. all over that like no tomorrow and we're not Paying, we're not paying dearly for that. Well, we are paying for it now. We're being forced yes. to. I mean, we didn't do anything ourselves, so now we're being forced to take steps. And unfortunately, in now, some cases, it's really we haven't taken any positive steps. Um, I would agree with you. You've been from the sooks of North Africa to the sky 
scrapers of APAC. Your career has spanned the globe. How do you adapt your strategies across such diverse cultural landscapes without getting lost in translation, or more importantly, offending an entire continent? Well, first of all, I offend everybody by definition. I did things that that are, you know, I eat kosher, and so we had to kosher chickens in Korea, and doing so, I had to like go with Chabad. You shecked it, Korean chickens. chickens. I did. So, we but, you did. Know, but I hear so, South Korean fried chicken is great, though. It's fantastic, but you first of all have to kosher right. it. And so right. I've certainly done a lot of things that make make a lot of people uncomfortable. But you know, the first thing I do, I do seriously for a second, I read books about the other, the place I'm going to, right? Trying to understand where right. we're coming from. That's number one. Number two, I talk to people that either are from that descent and try to understand them a little bit and try to understand what makes them work. And I have learned over the years, and I every year I become slightly better at it, is be empathetic to the other party. Right today, it's very normal for us to work in one day with people from Poland, from people from the Ukraine, from people from Israel, from people from the Netherlands, and from the US, all in the span of an hour. Very normal. And the one thing that works always with every single human out there is empathy. And so right. as long as I keep that in mind, and as long as I start my conversation with a positive reinforcement of what they're telling me, this is what you're telling me, I understand where you're coming from, I can see your point of view, how about we think about it also from this perspective and see if we can come together to a better place. It doesn't always work, but more often than not, people at least open up to a conversation. What's one of your favorite places to travel? And is it about the food or the ad tech? I have a huge weak spot for Seoul. The nightlife there is right. amazing. The food, you have me when the food takes less than five minutes to prepare. Anything that's okay. more than five minutes, I go crazy. So you like shawarma? Food? I love oh, shawarma. Shawarma, you know, galbi, bulgogi, anything that's like quick and to the point with not too much fanfare makes me happy. What's the most surprising insight you learned from one culture that was completely alien to another? You know, if I draw a picture for you or for you guys, for anybody that's listening to this, with three faces and two of those faces are sad faces and the middle face is a smiley face. And I ask you and I tell you, you're the middle person, right? You're the middle person between two sad faces. And I say, how do you feel? What would be your answer? Happy. Okay. This is a very typical Western answer, right? When we see ourselves being happy, well, that's how I feel. I'm happy. You ask exactly the same question to a person in China, in Japan, in Korea, and you'll get the opposite question. They'll say, I'm sad. And you'll say, why are you sad? Because those two are sad. And to me, that was an eye opener. Are they more communal, you think? It's confusionism. It's a different way of thinking. You know, even simple things like, you know, you go to Central Park in New York, you know, when they saw a new lawn just before spring, the signs right. say, don't even think about stepping on the lawn, right? New yeah, grass. Yeah. In China, the sign will say, the grass is sleeping. I kid you not. Right. Yeah, but in China, what is the punishment if you step on the grass? It might be jail. <laughs> that's taking it to a new level, yes. <laughs> it might have <laughs> something to do with it also. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true. But it's also for, you know, we call people handicapped people. People in those countries will call them special able people. It's just a different way of talking about things. To share this juiciest tidbit from your recent escapades, anything scandalous enough to make the office gop some mill faster? Spin faster? Oh, totally, totally. So in Korea, when um, I was, I mean, I've got stories about Netherlands and the US, but the spicy story that I've got that I always find fascinating is when you go to any office in Korea, you see a lot of bodyguards outside. Right. You know, seriously, <laughs> like they look like Marines. And I always ask them, like, what exactly are these people doing here? Like, what are we afraid of? And they're like, for the authorities. I'm like, excuse me? And they're like, for the authorities. And then they start to tell me about this incident of the X-Files, where the company at that time was holding files on celebrities. It was all in the public. Now, many years later, people went to jail for that. But it was holding files on celebrities. And any time we needed a celebrity for a commercial shoot, and they wouldn't agree to the terms of the agreement, the files would come up. And the files right. simply said, do you really want people to know that you're gay? Do you want people to really know you're doing this? And those files were used. So I was bewildered by the approach, business approach. So the bodyguards were to keep police away from them? The bodyguards were there to stall them as much as possible so that we can <laughs> get rid of information that otherwise might be incriminating. Can you sh tell... tell uh, sorry, can you share a tale of a campaign that needed a quick pivot to avoid a cultural faux pas? That's a very good one. I knew I, I, knew I should have been a little prefer it. Um... 
In Russia, we had a campaign where we needed to, we had to, there were two things in India and in Russia where we had to deal with mobile devices and the way that people actually talked about them. So in India, people often use two different SIM cards, you know, for their mobile devices. And so we had to, and we were trying to advertise mobile devices and we had to learn that they really had the distinct different mindset on how their personal life went and their business life went. And we had to change the entire campaign to explain that very clearly because otherwise people would have been offended. And in Russia, we had some um, we needed to sell, it wasn't mobile devices, it was actually LED televisions and all of the concept of using sex to sell the LED television or birds in the case of the US, the way that we sold them didn't work for Russia. So we had to like shift our position and find a local Russian famous film director that would talk about how cinematography is so important and how visual display is so critical to have the right image come the way that he wants it to come over. And we had to change the entire campaign for that so they're not we had to shift campaigns simply because we didn't have a better a good understanding of the local market which cost us a lot more money to produce gave us some delays but eventually helped us actually to perform better in those markets um so i wanted to move on to funtico i believe it's called so uh, you are getting getting involved with a company called funtico what's yes. it called again funtico and you it is a uh, company is diving headfirst in the chaotic, promise-filled waters of, B of Web3 gaming. Um, Funtico is marching in the Web3 gaming war zone with a flag that reads "Ultimate Rewards" and nail-biting competitions. What's the what's the game plan here? Are we talking a full frontal assault, or is there secret diplomacy at a plan to win over the masses? It's it's one of the biggest problems of Web three or blockchain is that people just are having a hard time adapting to it. It's too complicated. Wallets right. on ramping, off ramping, compliance. What's allowed? What's not allowed? Token generation events, altcoins, Elon Musk. You name it. There's a whole bunch of complications. What the team there has set out to do was to say, you know what? We're going to raise money the traditional way. We're just going to find private money. We're going to build mm -hmm. a team. We're going to build a studio or acquire studios. In some cases, we acquired studios. Build the games, create a platform, and allow people to actually play off-chain. So you don't need a wallet or anything else in order to play the games. But if you want to enter into the rewards part of it, if you want to win the pool of money that it comes in, it's a skill-based game, then and you, you have to get to the point of being comfortable with NFTs and getting comfortable with a rewards mechanism out there. Now, the good news is with Fortnite and Roblox and Minecraft, so people already know how to buy all those digital rewards. We just right. added the layer of Web3 into it. So what sparked the creation? Was it a vision of a new gaming dynasty or more of an accidental stumble into the Web3 arena? No, these are people actually that, that have been in the gaming business for a long time. They're Israelis okay. and Dutch, so they even are in the actual gaming business, so they can casino business in addition to that and they saw a tremendous opportunity of all of the learnings they have from their traditional world of gaming as well as all the world learnings that they have from casino types of life to kind of merge that together and use the new world of web3 to open up an assault on the existing platforms out there so the goal is to have a marketplace for the rewards and for all of the lives and characters and clothes and you know accoutrements you can buy so that people can trade sell and buy from each other and then the ability to actually have skill-based games where you can actually win and get rewarded for that and eventually you know use those rewards for financial you know cash out if you want to but all do it in a very compliant way how are they solving the scalability issue there's been web3 seems to have a scalability and frankly user friendliness issue how are they going to slay um, that problem i mean in the case of the gaming they've chosen avalanche as a platform which now allows for fast transactions and again most of the games all of the games can be played off chain so there's no need to actually generate any tokens there's no need to actually mint anything and that you know passes the issue of transaction speeds that are you know that's a challenge across the board in web3 so funko is promising gigantic prizes how are you going to ensure these treasures don't turn into curse loot given the vial i can't even say it now how volatile the crypto and nft markets are you know let's be clear it's definitely not for the the faint of heart right the market right. is incredibly volatile this year alone bitcoin has increased in value by 50 percent um and we saw the dips you know, back in 2019 and back in 22 when Celsius and FTX exploded. So there's, there's nothing to, to tell us when the next dip will happen. It will happen. By definition, it will happen because it's incredibly volatile. Right. Um, 
However, however, those who have patience and those who are not spending their life savings on it and they're playing in this case because it's it's games that you're playing, I think that it has a lot of fun for them. And in our case, you know, we're launching with a hundredth prize for a formula from Tico, which is a game skill based game, um, mm-hmm. and they're going to get their what you're winning is basically an NFT that's not tied to us. It's an NFT that we purchase in the open market, right, on Open Sea. That's currently valued at that amount. Now, it could be that that amount is going to continue to grow because right now there's a bull run, right? There could be a, a situation where people say, you know what, today I'm, I'm going to pay you half of that, whatever the amount is. And that's the risk that we take in this marketplace. But, you know, Pesach, there's nothing different than technically if you buy a house or if you buy a painting, the value of items goes up and down all the time. Clearly, in this market, more extreme, right? I've seen a lot of people wiped out. But I don't, you know, over time, if you look from 2000s and beyond, the trend line over time has been upwards and it's not been downwards. So part of the problem is Web3 games are extremely complicated. How are you planning to breach this barrier and and welcome the uninitiated? Well, you know, the game Solitaire, or if you look at like dropping dropping bombs, you know, there, there are games out there that for, you know, again, for the regular people who are not like into hardcore gaming, but they want to have just a fun, creative way to like pass their time. These are the games that are part of the production that we're releasing. And so we've got AAA games that are more complicated, like EV2, and that's going to be released. Uh, we're going to make the announcement very soon in a couple of weeks at a, at a gaming show. And obviously I speak, I'm speaking about it right now, but then there are many games out there that we're producing that actually are you know, very simple, mindless, and easy for people to like play without having to know all the tricks and tips out there. One of the issues of blockchain has been the carbon footprint. It's been brought up a lot that especially mining rigs, but just in general, the entire ecosystem is not environmental friendly. How is Funtico addressing environmental concerns associated with blockchain technology? Are we planting trees with every game played or is it more of a burn the forest to save it approach? No, the goal is not to burn the forest. I think that your point is incredibly valid and it's valid everybody who has commented on this. Obviously, minting is tremendously energy inefficient. Uh, the computing power that's needed is increasingly more complicated, right? And so, you know, the solution that we felt is best is to not have to go for every single transaction on the chain and actually right. force a transaction to happen. We feel very strongly that the games can be played without having having the need to do an on-chain transaction, we can build a database, we can add anything and subtract anything to the database. And when the time comes when you want to actually, you know, perform a transaction of selling something you own to another person, or if you want to buy something that another person owns, that's really the only time that we're going to force a transaction on the blockchain that will require some calculation. And again, unlike going the route of coins that require a lot more, you know, we've selected a platform like Avalanche, but there are others as well that a little bit more efficient. But we're not anywhere near where we need to be. And I think that your idea, by the way, of planting trees when you're actually minting, I love that idea. It's a great idea. Offsetting. So I may have to like borrow that idea from you. So what prophecies can you share about the future of Web3 Gaming? Any foresights into the challenges and triumphs that are ahead? Wow. I mean, any, listen, anybody who believes that Web3 is going away, I think that, I don't think that they're thinking straight. The reality is that this is a technology that's needed, that people are embracing, that has a lot of promise. Beyond the cryptocurrency, beyond what, you know, people are talking about and beyond all of the regulatory issues that we've got, I think that that this is something that uh, is is something that's incredibly important and is going to continue to grow. I very much believe that there is, we've just scratched the surface with it. You know, we started with altcoins. We started with just creating companies left and right. that didn't necessarily have any real product. And I think that we're now at a stage where more and more companies are being built that actually have a business model, actually have a revenue stream, actually have products that are actually sending and shipping out to consumers. And so the ecosystem is becoming more viable and more real in that regard. Again, in 2016, where we were pitching a lot of ideas out there, people were simply pitching an idea without a team, without a place of business, without registrations, without even their IP registered. They were just pitching ideas and saying, believe in me and greatness will come. And now a lot of companies are building it. They're creating the initial milestones. They have a beta to show for. And then people will say, okay, this is interesting. I want to put more of my efforts into that. And I want to continue and scale up. You know, at the end of the day, it's it. 
what will what will determine if we're actually able to like continue to grow Web three is if we build viable businesses the same way that we've been doing in EdTech and Mart. If you could swap lives with any fictional character for a day, who would it be and why? Um, fictional character. Hmm. I like. Uh, I mean, you're gonna laugh, but I actually enjoy Kermit the Frog. You want to be Kermit the Frog? Why? I do. I do. You know, he brings so much. Do, do, do you have a weird? Do you have a weird thing for Miss Piggy? Is that what it is? I do have a weird thing. As a Jew, a practicing Jew doesn't eat pig. You have to understand. There's a lot of enticement that comes along with Miss Piggy. But beyond that, I have a lot of good. <laughs> I have a lot of good memories of Kermit and the show. It. It's. It. You know. I. I grew up with it. In Israel, we only had one television channel when I grew up. Right. Uh, the Muppet Show was actually part of the sleuth of television shows we got, which was not that many. And so I have a, it, to me, it's, it has a very deep connection because it's what I grew up with. And, and to this day, I find the shows incredibly entertaining. But what's your favorite, besides Kermit, what's your other favorite character? So the Swedish chef? I mean, Swedish chef, the pigs in space, you know, Beaker. I can go on. Ralph, you, see, you seem to talk a lot piano. about pigs. I'm telling you, there's a <laughs> fascination you... with me about about pigs. If it's you like could have any superpower food. for, if you could hate Sadas, if you could have any superpower for a day, what would it be and how would you use it? Oh, you know, on a personal note, if I can cure cancer, I would do it in a heartbeat. I am affected by it with my family deeply. Sorry. And the pain that it causes on the patients and the families wow. is tremendous. It's true for any illness. I would, I would, it would be incredible. And you know, even, even now beyond cancer, if we're not talking about illness, if I can help solve the problem in the Middle East, between us, the Jews and Israelis, and the rest of the Arab world, oh my God, yeah. nothing compares to being able to either of that or the other. If your life was a movie, what genre would it be now? Comedy, drama, or action-packed thriller? <laughs> It'd be drama. I call the last five years the spicy years of my life. So I would call it absolutely drama. Have you ever had a moment where you felt like you were living in your own sitcom? Or was it more like a horror movie? Never a horror movie. There's, there are definitely moments when, you know, you couldn't make the shit up as you go along. Have you ever had like a face palm moment where you're just like, I can't believe this just happened? Where you just laughed at yourself? A lot. A lot. I'll give you an example, okay? This is going to sound really crazy. When I was on a week, you know, I assume that you know Google Alerts, right? I'm sure you have Google Alerts on people you follow. I never read yeah, them. Comes I my, never ever read. I my just, email box all the time. Exactly. I delete the delete. On a particular yeah. morning. Yeah, I have ones that are like years old that I don't even pay attention to anymore. I just haven't got around so, to deleting them. And so believe it or not, on a particular morning, I open up a Google Alert and I'm seeing the first couple of lines and I see that my business partner was arrested. Again, I cool. never click on them. Yes. Right. This time yes. you did. And so this time I did. And this time I found out that the 43-year-old male out of Brooklyn was arrested at JFK. And so um, you couldn't make the shit up. And lo and behold, as it progresses and eventually ended up in jail, I had to find myself dealing with the SEC and the Attorney General. And I have to tell you, out of all the things in my life I dealt with, I never imagined that that would ever happen in my life. Ever. And one thing right. I can tell you, you as a person who actually worked in your past in that environment, I'm incredibly impressed, incredibly impressed by their professionalism, incredibly impressed. I'm in awe by these people. They could have gone to any top white shoe law firm and instead they make a calling out of it to do something different. I'm in awe. So who is your Yoda in life? Is there one person, sorry, my about in the industry? You're my Yoda. Anyone, in, anyone the industry, in the industry that affected? Uh, yeah, I would say Dave Morgan from Samo Media is a person I trust implicitly. Tom Deerline, what did who he, I worked what, with. What did, what did Dave teach you? What do you think is the most important thing he taught you was? It's going to sound and I'm, a, and I'm a huge I'm a huge Dave Morgan fan. So There's two things he taught me. He said, don't go into product marketing because that's not your forte. He said it right. very clearly to me. And the other thing he said is when we had to reorganize recently a company, he said, cut more people than you originally planned for. You won't be sorry. And, uh, you know, those two lessons I've taken, I've not only followed them, but I've taken it to heart. Is there anyone in the industry that you'd like to spend maybe an hour in an elevator with? Hmm. Yes. I feel like I could spend more time with Tim Armstrong. I've known him over the years, but I haven't spent enough time with him to learn more from him. So Tim Armstrong what would, would be a person I would love to spend What would you guys would chat with about, except besides uh, how do we get out of this elevator? How did he manage to build the advertising business of Google as he did? 
That's what I want to chat with him about. I want to learn from him. I mean, I knew him when he was at Snowball selling advertising, and then he became the team that we all know. I'd like to understand how he went from that to that. Where did you acquire your most valuable skill, you think? Dancing. I've done ballroom dancing and Latin dances all my life, and it right. enabled me to learn how to approach people I don't know and ask them out for a dance. And that's true for business. I apply the same approach to business. It's a very humbling moment when you go to a dance floor and you go to a person you totally don't know and you say to them, would you like to dance with me? You might get rejected. You can totally reject it. And it's horrible when you're on a dance floor and somebody rejects you. But when it works, when it works, magic can happen. And I think that in business, every day, every day, we do the same thing. We say to you, another person, would you like to go and dance with me? So do you have um, a lot of dance partners or do you limit your partners? No. And that just sounded so wrong. No, you said it perfectly, (laughs) but that's because where you are. I think that, first of all, I do believe that you can have many dance partners as long as you're honest with them. So as long as you're honest with them, you can have many dance partners. So you can interpret that any way you want to. That's true for my personal life as well as for my business life. Um, Last but not least, if you could send yourself a text message, a time traveling text message back to the past when you started in the industry, what would you tell yourself? Have more patience. My Israeli side is like having a fire under my butt all day long. I have zero patience and I had even less patience, even less patience when I was younger. And I constantly wanted to do something more. Like, oh, yeah, but I can become the CMO. Why do I have to be director of marketing? Oh, I can become this. Why do I have to do that? Instead of just like putting in the time, put in the time and then grow with it. Sometimes I was impatient and that led to some fatal mistakes along the way. I mean, I recovered from those mistakes. And just like that, our show's wrapped up tighter than a hipster's man bun. Big shout out to Doran Wesley for dropping by and blowing our minds. Truly the man's a wizard in the ad tech universe. Also got to tip our hats off to our sponsor, Troutman and Men, for making this wild ride possible. Deserve to win when it matters most. Stick around, folks, because next week we're cranking up to another notch. Until then, I'm Pesach Latin, and you've been tuned in to The Adonit Show.